It was a vote seen as a battle for Poland's future. Andrzej Duda has been re-elected president of Poland in a narrow He also supports the government's moves to increase its control over the media and Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching The Listening Post, working from home. Here are some of the media stories we're covering this week. Poland re-elects its president after the government turns back the clock to the good old days of state-controlled television. He won the Nobel Peace Prize last year, but now the Ethiopian prime minister has shut down a major news network and jailed its founder. Rasan Kanafani, the Palestinian voice that, like so many authors, got his start in journalism. Welcome home. And Disney World in Florida lays out the welcome mat you don't belong here. through a video that goes spectacularly wrong. Polish voters have re-elected their president, Andrzej Duda, to another term in office, but only just. Duda, who was aligned with the ruling Law and Justice Party, scraped in with 51% of the vote. And the government's control of the public broadcaster, Telewizja Polska, or TVP, helped get him over the line. To many Poles, TVP could just as well stand for Telewizja Propaganda. The channel backed Duda to the hilt in this campaign and went after his opponent, the mayor of Warsaw, Rafał Czaskowski. Privately owned news outlets, channels like TVN, newspapers like FACT, have been far more critical of Duda. So the president and his backers have tried to delegitimize those platforms over their foreign ownership. They've played the xenophobia card, suggesting that German investors in Polish media companies were trying to swing this election, and they're not above homophobia either. Now, the Law and Justice Party government is talking about the repolinization of the country's privately owned media, which is code for nationalization. Our starting point this week is the Polish capital, Warsaw. Poles are proud. They like to remind their Czech, Ukrainian, and East German neighbors that in the late 1980s, it was Poland's solidarity movement, the will of its people, that emboldened others to stand up and stare Moscow down. Poles will accept credit for the fall of communism and the Soviet bloc, the reintroduction of democracy to so many countries. Now, about that democracy. Poland's state-owned broadcaster, TVP, is sounding more and more like Pravda. The wybór Andrzeja Dudy lub Rafała Trzaskowskiego to wybór między polską przyjazną rodziną, polską wierną tradycji i patriotyzmowi, a polską skrajnie lewicowej ideologii. Poles have just voted in round two of a presidential election between incumbent Andrzej Duda and challenger Rafał Trzaskowski. There was no televised debate. That's a first in 20 years. And TVP, Telewizja Polska, is getting the blame. The responsibility for failing to deliver a fair pre-election debate lies with TVP. They refused to collaborate on a joint debate. But this is not the first time TVP has supported the government. Public media has been doing this for the last five years. But it just became more obvious during this campaign. We had this bizarre situation in which the two candidates both refused to attend debates organized by media that were more hostile towards them and sympathetic towards their opponent. And we ended up with both candidates holding debates simultaneously, completely separate from one another and on their own. So these weren't debates at all. TVP works like, like uh, North Korean uh, TV channel, making uh, God of the president. And when this debate was held only with Mr. President. And in fact, half of this audience were party apparatchiks and uh, they had their questions written uh, on a piece of paper and they were asking them and he was definitely prepared to answer them. Takie rzeczy będą po wyborach zachowane, czy będą wypalone żelazem. Że jeżeli ja zostanę wybrany na Urząd Prezydenta Rzeczypospolitej ponownie, na kolejne 5 lat, jak pozwala polska konstytucja, to wszystkie te programy będą utrzymane. Czy wy... To, co było symboliczne dla... This campaign has been characterized by each candidate operating within their own media bubble. There is no confrontation, no debate, and each candidate believed his bubble to be bigger. However, President Duda's bubble turned out to be big enough to make him president of Poland for the next five years. But 
But Duda's bubble always was bigger. The government has seen to that, pumping another half billion dollars into the state-owned TVP this year, which Duda approved. In 2015, the Law and Justice Party, known by its Polish acronym, PiS, took power for the second time. It set its sights on TVP and transformed it, from a channel that tended to lean toward whatever government was in power to a virtual mouthpiece. It installed new bosses, PiS loyalists, who announced TVP's journalists would have to reapply for their own jobs. Scores were fired, forced out, or just left. Polls saw the results of that in the coverage of this election. Independent surveys found that 97% of TVP's reporting on President Duda's campaign was positive. The other 3% was neutral. TVP famously aired a five-minute video on the evening news and it looked like the finale of a Hollywood movie. It featured Andrzej Duda greeting people, hugging children, walking with farmers and business people. There were pensioners trying to touch and thank him. And also slogans about responsibility, patriotism, strength. It may seem an extreme example, but it is representative of TVP's attitude towards the president. Public media would not only praise Duda, they would also openly attack his rival, Rafał Czaskowski. They would uh, suggest that he was hoping for a, a, a radical left-wing revolution, that he represented a powerful foreign lobby. Komentatorzy zwracają uwagę, że właśnie zagraniczne powiązania kandydata Koalicji Obywatelskiej na prezydenta mogą być powodem, dla którego Trzaskowski nie występował twardo w obronie polskiej racji stanu. They suggested he was supportive of the introduction of LGBT ideology, as they and President Duda call it. A jego pojęcie rodziny bliższe jest poglądom skrajnej lewicy. Which was presented as a threat to Polish culture, to Polish children um, in particular. They were using arguments. Uh, which were ranging from uh, anti-Semitic through homophobic, uh, through nationalistic and chauvinistic against uh, Germans. All the dirt that they could uh, use, they used. And it was really sad that it worked. People turned out and they were mostly people of 60 plus age from the provinces. This propaganda was digging for their support. TVP's coverage of Rafał Czaskowski, the current mayor of Warsaw, has chilling parallels to a story last year. Pavel Adamowicz, the mayor of Gdańsk, had similar progressive policies and was also running against a peace candidate. The treatment he got from TVP was similar to what Czaskowski experienced in this election. Polls were shocked last year when, at a charity event, Adamowicz was murdered, knifed to death, by a former prison inmate while on the inside reportedly watched TVP day in, day out. Nobody will be able ever to, to, to prove that the perpetrator of this murder was uh, uh, instigated, but the campaign against Czaskowski was run in the same way as against Adamowicz. He was accused of planning to take away special benefits for the poorest and move this money to the Jews. Every day there were new fake informations about him. You cannot even believe that somebody can imagine things like that, but they were saying that. TVP's competition on the airwaves consists of two privately owned channels, TVN and Polsat. TVN has become an unofficial opposition channel almost by default. But for many Poles in rural areas and small towns, TVP is the only domestic news channel available. Peace polls well with those voters. TVN is foreign-owned. So is FACT, Poland's most widely read newspaper. President Duda quickly pointed that out when the paper criticized his track record. Axel Springer z niemieckim rodowodem, który jest właścicielem gazety Fakt, chce wpłynąć na wybory prezydenckie w Polsce, tak? But Ringier Axel Springer, the foreign conglomerate that owns Fakt, is more Swiss than it is German. Foreign-owned news outlets are beyond the peace government's control, which is why there's been talk of changing that through what Poles call the repolinization of the country's news media. Krzysztof Skowroński, has been with TVP since 2016, 
when peace cleansed the channel of potential critics. When Poland transitioned from communism, no one controlled the movement of capital. As a consequence, much of Polish media is owned by foreign companies, and so the media landscape lacked balance throughout the 90s until 2015. Naturally, an injection of $500 million from the government makes TVP supreme in the media landscape, but we need public media to ensure a functioning democracy and the public media need to prosper for this to happen. But public media in Poland have a legal statutory obligation to be uh, balanced, uh, independent, um, not to favor one side. And so regardless of whether it's true or not that um, the bias on uh, state TV has balanced out the media landscape, this is simply not permitted. They're not allowed to be biased in this way. And there are many broadcasters on radio, television, and also um, newspapers, magazines, which are conservative and supportive of law and justice. They existed before 2015, they exist now. The talk of the repolinization of private media is just that, talk. It's more of a political tactic than a real possibility. Eliminating foreign ownership of media in Poland, even limiting it, is highly unlikely because of the European Union and its free trade rules. The government knows that. Its leaders and their allies in the media also know that if they talk about the specter of German control, even if the company in question is really Swiss, more gullible eyes will turn to TVP in search of the truth, the Polish word for which happens to be Pravda. We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar this week with one of our producers, Flo Phillips. Flo, the Ethiopian news outlet, Oromia Media Network, is back in the spotlight. We know it's had a troubled history. What's the latest? OMN is an important voice for the Oromo ethnic group who make up the majority in Ethiopia. When we last reported on OMN, it was the moment that they just got back into the country, having been broadcasting from exile for years. It was actually one of the first moves that Prime Minister Abe Ahmed made, he's actually an Oromo himself, when he came to power two years ago. But on June 30th, police raided their offices, shut them down, and arrested its founder, Jawa Mohammed, accusing the network of inciting ethnic violence and spreading fake news. Now, this was related to their coverage of the killing of a famous Oromo singer just the day before. His death set off protests which police responded to with deadly force. More than 200 people, mostly Oromos, have been killed since, and the network was all over the story. The details are sketchy, though, since the government shut down the internet for two full weeks. Oromos thought that things would change for the better under Abiy Ahmed. So what happened? Right. Abiy was lauded for his reforms both at home and abroad. Last year, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And OMN and its founder, Jawa Mohammed, were both instrumental in the social movement that helped bring him into office. But the tide has most definitely turned. Jawa Mohammed has become a fierce critic of the government, and his large online following is perhaps no longer appreciated by the Prime Minister. Another country with a well-deserved reputation for silencing and jailing journalists is Egypt's. Now journalists there face yet another threat, the coronavirus? Indeed, Richard. Mohamed Monir was a prominent Egyptian journalist and writer. Monir had long complained that the authorities were threatening him over his articles and his appearances on Al Jazeera Arabic. A month ago, he was arrested on charges of, quote, spreading fake news and belonging to a terrorist organization, which is a line that you well may recognize as we've heard it coming out of Egypt many times before. Now, COVID-19 has ripped through the Egyptian prison system. And this past Monday, just days after he'd been released on bail, Monir did succumb to the coronavirus. He had been being held at the notorious Torah prison just outside Cairo, which is where Al Jazeera's own Mahmoud Hussein has been jailed for three and a half years without trial or charge. Okay, thanks, Flo. 
Some of the biggest names from the world of literature, Charles Dickens, Ernest Hemingway, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Maya Angelou, got their start in journalism. Their reporting tends to be forgotten. Their prose is what lives on. Rassan Kanafani is a name you can add to that list. Kanafani was a Palestinian writer who, through books like Men in the Sun, humanized the Palestinian condition of dispossession and displacement. But he was first and foremost a journalist. Kanafani was also a product of 1960s Beirut, a period when the city was a magnet for young reporters and revolutionaries, migrants and misfits. Lebanon was also playing host to the Palestinian leadership in exile at the time. It was in Beirut that Kanafani produced Al Hadaf, a forward-thinking Palestinian magazine that has been somewhat lost in the mists of time. The Listening Post's Tarak Nafa now from Beirut on Hassan Kanafani, and the era of Palestinian revolutionary media. There are some voices, rare ones, that can take a moment in time and give it meaning. Voices of clarity that are themselves not easily defined. Hassan Kanafani, a writer, artist, journalist, playwright and politico, was one of those people. Surely as the Middle East turmoil keeps away the tourists... A video from 1970, a news report, captures Kanafani in the city where he made his name. In Beirut, a new business has developed. Revolution. Palestinian revolution. He's interviewed by Richard Carlton for Australia's ABC News. The Beirut leader of the Popular Front is Gashan Kanafani. He was born in Palestine but fled in 1948, as he puts it, from Zionist terror. As the English-speaking spokesman of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the PFLP, Kanafani made good TV, but he was by no means an easy interviewee. It does seem that the war, the civil war, has been quite fruitless. It's not a civil war. It's a people defending themselves against a fascist government. It's a moment of great confidence, of clarity of vision, of conviction. And the way Rassan Kanafani speaks in that clip shows all of this, this energy that was the hope of the Palestinian revolution. Well, the conflict. It's not a conflict. It's a liberation movement fighting for justice. Well, whatever it might be best called. It's not whatever. Kanafani picks up on a very important word, which for me resonated the strongest, and this is the word whatever. This is exactly where the problem starts. This is a people who is discriminated, is fighting for his rights. This is a story. And this is the narrative that Palestinians unfortunately have not been able to relay to the world. The Palestinian narrative as narrated by Palestinians is not something that the world wants to hear. Why not just talk? Talk to whom? Talk to the Israeli leaders. That's kind of conversation between the sword and the neck, you mean? When Ghassan came to ask him... Ghassan said it in simple and clear language. How are we supposed to have dialogue? You're coming to slaughter me. Put aside the sword so we can have a conversation. They're better that way than dead, though. Maybe to you, but to us, it's not. To us, to liberate our country, to have dignity, to have respect, to have our mere human rights, is something as essential as life itself. In the Arab imagination, Kanafani is remembered for his storytelling, which explored the Palestinian experience, statelessness, separation and exile. In the West, he was the public face of the leftist PFLP, seen as one of the more radical Palestinian factions. Kanafani was not involved in the armed wing of the PFLP, or in the planning of high-profile airplane hijackings that the group became synonymous with. But he was an advocate of armed struggle and understood its mediatic value. If it went quiet, he wrote, no TV network would willingly give any Palestinian a minute of coverage to express themselves. Above all, though, Kanafani was a journalist, an accomplished one. Rassan Kanafani was a multifaceted, multi-talented human being. He was very significant in the Kuwaiti and Lebanese press in their heyday. We're talking about the 1950s and 60s. Rassan Kanafani was a central figure 
I mean, he was associated with the founding of many magazines and newspapers throughout the region. Beirut in the 1960s and 70s was an extremely vibrant city. It was a truly Arab city and the Palestinian revolution it was kind of the last hope for people. And so that's why Arabs from all over went to uh, Beirut to be part of that last front for revolution and creativity and activity and literature and journalism. After the defeat of Arab regimes in the War of 1967 and the disillusionment that came with it, Palestinians took matters into their own hands. A national struggle for liberation took form and for Kenafani, it marked a shift in thinking to the revolutionary politics of the PFLP. In 1969, he was made editor-in-chief of Al Hedef, the group's newly formed weekly magazine. Al Hedef was revolutionary in spirit and substance. It combined the PFLP's political messaging with analysis, humor, art, and calligraphy in a chronicle of the Palestinian resistance that linked it to anti-colonial struggles in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. He made left-wing media accessible well beyond the narrow confines of the already converted. He went after arguments by fellow Arab journalists as much as he went after arguments by Western journalists. His article were an unusual combination of satire sharp witticism as well as uh, information. I mean, can you imagine Soviet communist literature using humor and irony at that time? There was none of that. And Arab communists were even more dour, uh, more humorless uh, than the Soviet Union. So you can imagine when Ghassan Kafani comes with this new form of media, it was entirely novel. Al Hedef had an open door policy that made it a hub of cultural and artistic exchange. It was there that Kenafani and his associates produced some of the most iconic posters of the Palestinian Revolution. It was a progressive magazine with an engaged international readership, but it was the official party organ, some would say the mouthpiece, of the PFLP. Kill me, mouthpiece. I don't like the term mouthpiece. It's not true. Neither was it propaganda. We were not spreading propaganda. We were trying to get the truth to the people. That was the slogan of Al Hedef. It read, the truth is always revolutionary, which is what Lenin wrote. These truths were the refugee camps or the truth of the Palestinian situation. Al Hedef was open to accept all kinds of new ideas. And for this reason, I think the importance of literature and journalism and culture from that era is that it was the founding culture. Kenafani left a distinctive imprint on the Arab cultural and media space. There is his pioneering fictional writing, and then there is this huge body of journalistic work. And when you look at the range of his output, you get the sense, perhaps, that he knew his time was limited, that he had a target on his back. On the 8th of July, 1972, Kanafani and his niece were killed in a car bomb outside his home. He was 36. It was among the first in a series of Israeli assassinations targeting Palestinian leaders and cultural figures. In its obituary of Kanafani, Lebanon's Daily Star said he was a commando who never fired a gun, whose weapon was a ballpoint pen, and his arena newspaper pages. Israel decided to go after all facets of the Palestinian national movement. Whether they were writers, journalists, combatants, they made no distinction whatsoever. They wanted to extinguish the flame of the Palestinian national movement in all its forms. Ghassan Kanafani has gone through two lives. There was the life that he actually lived on this planet. And there was a second life that he has been living after his death, especially in the last 20 years. His iconic image is almost everywhere. There's so many Facebook pages dedicated to him, Instagram pages. Resistance for him was something that was not necessarily just an action. The heart of resistance could be in 
the written word and this voice of hope and aspiration and clarity and conviction we don't have anymore and that's why this resonates so strongly with us today. And finally, the last thing that Walt Disney World in Florida wants to be is a Mickey Mouse operation. But it chose to reopen last week, and the very next day, Florida set a record. More than 15,000 new cases of coronavirus, the most reported in a single day by any U.S. state. Not to worry, Disney World released a promotional video to convince us it was still safe, showing masked employees in the theme park all saying, welcome home enter the internet. The thing about people speaking behind a mask is, you can make them say anything. Which is exactly what Brendan McKay, a comedian based in Los Angeles, did. First, he changed the soundtrack, then dubbed in a few lines of dialogue, gifting the rest of us the Disney World Horror Remix, a short but scary movie. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome. You don't belong here. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome. 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 Stand up. Welcome home. You don't belong here. Welcome home. Welcome. Welcome home. Welcome. 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 Welcome back. You shouldn't be here.